helps performance bartenders. He's been studying his craft for over 15 years. And for Scott, drink preparation is serious business. We really want to uh, basically be a performer behind the bar, have a little fun, and give customers a reason to you know, come to the bar, stay a little longer, spend more money, and walk away talking about what a great time they had. Scott has used his years of experience to start ExtremeBartending.com, a company dedicated to teaching the art of the aerial. But hang on to your shot glass. Before you try this at home, you'll need to know the rules. First and foremost, stick to the basics. To show us how, we conjured up two of the most extreme flair bartenders from the Roxy Bar in Vancouver, British Columbia. All right, the very first move to learn is a single flip. Nice and light feet, light hand position, up and down. Once you get that, you can go reverse grip or you had a neck. Pass it off. You can try this at home, but don't start with bottles. First, try things that don't break, like fruit or plastic. When you're ready to move up to bottles, we have one last insider's piece of advice. Start by practicing in the yard. Grass, absolutely soft surfaces, so it's a little bit less risky. So knock yourself out and give it a try. To err is human, keep that in mind. But serving with flair, now that's divine. Four on our insiders list is drinks for non-drinkers. A really popular trend in the last few years now has been non-alcoholic drinks. Cocktails and juice, I mean, you can make a lot of the same types of drinks, but they're non-alcoholic. Welcome back to the Insider's List of Cocktails. I'm Julie Moran. Today we're at the lounge of the Los Santa Monica Hotel where they have all the secrets to mixing up a delicious drink. What do they know that you don't? Well, do you know what it means to float a spirit or how much to pour if your recipe calls for a dash? You're about to find out. To make a great drink, you've got to learn to mix, blend and shake. Coming in at number eight is a lesson in cocktail mixology. To get the scoop, we've consulted the pros, seasoned bartenders and experts who understand the true art of the cocktail. A cocktail is it's actually a cuisine, if you think about it. I mean, a cocktail is a combination of flavors blended together in a balance that almost creates a new flavor that's not the same as any one of the constituents inside of the drink originally. When it comes to making the perfect cocktail, a pro knows, and now you can too. An insider's tip on what makes a great cocktail is balance. It's about balance. You have to balance the sweet with the sour. But put your taste buds on hold, because according to Karen Brooks, author of Atomic Cocktails, there are a few items you'll definitely need before whipping up a drink. It's amazing how you can get the wow factor with just a few little accessories. I mean, you can get one of these really cool looking kits that's got the strainer and the pony and the jigger and all the little cutting tools in a stainless steel ice bucket and it looks really sharp and it'll probably cost you about $20. Using the right glasses can make or break your presentation, so skip the plastic cups. I think the glassware is definitely a factor when you're making a drink. You want it to look nice, you want it to have a a nice weight to it, a nice feel in your hand. So people come in, they're like, you know, that's just part of the whole experience. Remember the tall ones are highball glasses, while lowball glasses are short. And despite what people tell you, there's no such thing as a martini glass. The proper term is a cocktail glass. And that fancy stem is designed to allow you to hold your drink without warming it up with your hands. Cocktail glasses and accessories can be both fun and functional, but don't lose sight of the big picture and make sure the basic ingredients are always on hand. There will be at least three things I would always have. Always have vodka, and I always keep a jar of big fat olives and a good vermouth. So right away I know I can make a martini. The martini is the perennial king of cocktails. You probably know that it's a simple blend of gin or vodka with a touch of vermouth. But should it be shaken or stirred? While the debate rages on, purists are out to set the record straight. It's cocktail malpractice to shake a gin martini because what they will say to you is the ice in the shaking will bruise the gin. So what does bruising the gin really mean? 
Simply put, it's another way of saying watering down the flavor. A definite don't for any old school bartender. The biggest difference in shaking versus stirring lies in the temperature of the final martini. Stirring the drink with ice will result in a slightly stronger but warmer drink. A shaken martini will be much colder but slightly diluted because of the agitation. But a new generation of bartenders believe shaking is the wave of the future. The more you shake, the more the liquor, juice or whatever you put in it kind of gets infused. So it makes it taste better and you get a nice frothy cocktail there. Put the glass on, shake it. Get it cold, you want it very, very cold. The controversy between shaken and stirred cocktails rages on. But here's a good guideline to follow. Stir drinks that contain only spirits. Shake drinks that use fruit or citrus juice. But if your recipe does call for a splash of juice, don't use artificial ingredients. If you're serious about the cocktail craft, there's no substitute for fresh ingredients. That's really what's going to separate the pro from the dilettante. At the best bars, they should be squeezing the juice to order. When you're concocting a cocktail that's served over ice, smaller cubes will make your drink more crisp. And don't use ice that's over a month old. It will start to absorb the flavors of your freezer. Another important piece of info is knowing when to use those high-end brands. There's really no reason to break out the good stuff if that pricey premium label is going to get lost in the mix. I wouldn't use a top-shelf product uh, such as Grey Goose in a foo-foo drink such as a Bella. There's no point in using an expensive alcohol simply to drown it with other flavors. A common pitfall in cocktails that use tequila. Tequilas are very hot right now. Everybody's talking about tequilas. But if you're making a frozen margarita, really, you're not going to taste the tequila. So you're wasting your money to buy a great high-end tequila. Here's an insider's tip. There's at least one way to use a top-shelf tequila in your margarita without drowning the taste. If you want to do something special, make a frozen margarita, but don't put the tequila in. Blend all the other ingredients, and then take that special tequila and just splash it, float it on the top, so that as you're drinking the margarita, you're actually getting the taste of the tequila, and it's fabulous. When your drink recipe calls for a dash or a splash, there's actually a science to getting those measurements right. Again, it's not magic, it's know-how. Simple checkpoints on the insider's roadmap to making you a better bartender. These tips are guaranteed to leave an impression, but there's still lots of work to be done. The cocktail scene has a language all its own. For example, do you know what you're getting if you ask for a drink that's laced or perfect with a twist? Well, coming up, it's a special lesson on all the cocktail lingo you need to know. Aficionados looking to add a couple of classic cocktails to their arsenal take heed. We're going to show you how to make two of the most famous but forgotten old-time refreshments, the whiskey sour and the mint julep. Naturally, any good mint julep starts with mint. First, line your glass with a touch of bitters and add the mint along with a healthy dose of simple sugar. With a muddling utensil, break up the mint and drain the remaining simple sugar. Then fill it up with ice. Without measuring, drown most of the glass with a great tasting bourbon. And top it up. We've gotten to the bottom of where cocktails come from. We've explored the fine art of mixing liquors. Now it's time to explore the etiquette of cocktail culture. With flavors from melon to pepper and proofs from 56 to 151, there's a plethora of choices in the cocktail kingdom and a beverage for every personality. There are sophisticated drinks, there are silly drinks, there are sweet drinks, there are sour drinks, there are straight alcoholic drinks, and they do, in fact, correlate to people's personalities. Making tasteful choices is a pivotal part of being cocktail savvy. That brings us to number seven on our insider's list, knowing what to drink when. For the suave type A executive, the cocktail of choice is enjoyed just before dinner and usually comes shaken or stirred. It's the James Bond martini thing, you know? I mean, it's like, I can drink a really strong drink. That means I'm a really strong guy. Men might make it a double, but sophisticated ladies often prefer something with a splash of sweetness and a blush of color. 
Cosmopolitan is definitely a woman's drink. There's something about the color. It's kind of crimson and beautiful and pink. I can order a Cosmopolitan and, and still feel like a manly man. It's, some people would say it's a woman's drink, but I feel like if it tastes good and it works, then order it. When I go out, I like to order Cosmos, but I'm usually not allowed to because my friends usually have a problem with it. Usually I have to order a Jim Beam and Coke to satisfy my people. But don't be fooled. A manly martini and a girly Cosmo have about the same alcohol content, so imbibe accordingly. But there's another choice that's sophisticated and contains less alcohol. A classic mix of champagne, bitters, and a twist. If you're on a date, a really nice move is to order the champagne cocktail. I think it's, it's a sexy drink. Another safe bet for almost any occasion is the south of the border favorite. The margarita is universal. You, you can have that as a man or woman and there's no question asked. If you want to attract attention as a bold cocktail gourmand, order higher-end single malt scotches. Consumers of single malt scotch tend to have higher than average incomes and a reputation for putting their money where their mouth is. But a word to the wise, there are times when you don't want to be a show-off. If I went out with my boss, I'd drink what he drinks. <laughs> if he ordered a Manhattan, I'd order a Manhattan. No matter what you order, the most important thing to know while drinking on the job is when to call it quits. My rule of thumb, if you're in a business meeting, one cocktail is more than sufficient. Uh, I typically don't drink when I'm in business because I don't like to mix the two. Here's another intriguing fact. Studies show that you really are what you drink. Beer lovers top the charts as thrill seekers. Fans of the great prefer healthier lifestyles. And connoisseurs of spirits, just like well-constructed cocktails, are a perfect balance between extremes. But no matter what you might be enjoying as your drink of choice, keep in mind that cocktails are an art form, not an extreme sport. It's not about getting drunk, and it's not about just drinking. It's about celebrating something. I mean, that's really what a cocktail is. Now that you know what to order and when, you'll need to know how to order. Get ready to kick your cocktail savoir faire up a notch because we're about to learn the lingo. It's number six on our insiders list. The modern world of cocktail culture can be confusing. Drinks come shaken, stirred, blended, neat, dirty, wet, dry, straight up, on the rocks, and with a twist. There's a lot of lingo in the cocktail world, just like there is in the short order cook world. You know, I'll have two on whiskey down, you know, rye bread. Knowing your cocktail terms is a must, as it separates the connoisseurs from the clueless. It's actually one of the bartender's biggest pet peeves is when someone walks in and they have no idea how to order, but they probably just read Cosmo or GQ, and so they have like some sort of lingo and they use it so absurdly. Ordering a drink straight up on the rocks is a sure sign of a cocktail cup. Straight up on the rocks is completely two different things. You know, straight up is just poured out neat, nice and clean, with no ice, straight in a glass. On the rocks, obviously, is with ice. Here's another important FYI. Straight up is just another way of saying neat. If you want to add some panache to your lingo, order a cobbler, a tall cocktail made with shaved ice and a garnish of fresh fruit and mint. Toss off the term crusta and you won't get a pizza, but you will get a sour-based drink of your choice, lined with orange or lemon peel in a continuous strip. If it's more of a savory flavor you're craving, maybe it's time to mess things up. A dirty martini is served with a splash of olive juice straight from the olive jar. But martinis can also be dry or wet. Dry means you want just a whisper of vermouth, and wet means you want a healthy dose. If you hear the term perfect, it means a mix of both sweet and dry vermouth. If you aren't sure, don't guess to impress. Just tell the bartender what you want, and they'll do the translating for you. Coming up on the insider's list, we're putting your hosting skills to the test. It's the do's and don'ts of how to throw a cocktail party. Essential information from Fine Living. One of the things that you can do to make your...
No better way to share your newfound skills than by throwing a cocktail party where everyone has a great time, and that means you too. So what's the best way to get your guests to mingle? How many extra glasses should you have on hand? To find out, we got some inside tips from some seasoned party professionals. Number five on our insiders list is how to throw a cocktail party, because with the right know-how, staging a cocktail soiree can be a breeze. A cocktail party usually happens between 7 and, say, 10 o'clock in the evening. Cocktail parties usually don't go much, much further than, you know, two or three hours. It's the cocktail hour. Tony Schubert knows all about cocktail get-togethers. He's an event producer from Los Angeles who rescues party hosts in distress. I'm here today, basically, show our hostess um, how to set up the ultimate cocktail party. Maysoon Jabon Payne has just moved into her new home and hasn't even had time to unpack. But she's decided to throw a housewarming party so her friends can get a sneak peek. Tony's here to make sure everything is under control. You're hosting a little cocktail party tonight, I hear. Yes, yes. I'm trying to throw it together. You are, are you excited? Very, but a little nervous. A little nervous, okay. The first order of business? Cocktail parties are meant to be small, so pare down the guest list. I would definitely invite 20 and expect to have 12 or 15 show up. Keeping the numbers modest will encourage intimacy among your guests, and confining the party to one area will discourage people from breaking off into cliques. Here's another great cocktail trick to encourage mingling. Definitely take out all your furniture, whether you're doing it in a backyard or in your living room. The minute you have people sitting down, it really segregates certain people from other guests. Taking away a lot of the, the furniture allows people to converse much, much easier. Once you've moved the furniture, it's time to think about a drink station. Serving cocktails from your kitchen is a definite no-no. Every cocktail party needs a bar, and not many people have bars at their homes, so we need to find a table or something that can double as a bar. You've got a bar. Now all you need is a cocktail serving guru. If you can't afford a bartender, try to find one of your friends to fill in. You could probably find somebody at your local bar that would do it for 15, 20 bucks an hour. The cocktail hour usually happens when people get off work. And after a long day, they're thinking about more than just drinks. You definitely have to serve some sort of food or finger foods at a cocktail party. It's really tough when guests are coming, especially between that hour, especially after work. People are hungry. They may not have eaten since, uh, since lunchtime. Guests may arrive with big appetites, but for ease and convenience, make sure portions are small. If you can't eat it in one bite, don't serve it. You definitely want to have small servings, pop in your mouth, and you're done. You don't want to be holding a plate or a napkin with, you know, with, with one piece of food on it that's taking you three bites to eat. Absolutely not. The one hot ticket item that you'll need to secure before throwing a cocktail party is glassware. But you might be surprised to learn how many you'll need. It's really important, okay, that we have three times, even sometimes four times the amount of glassware um, for your guests. Okay. okay? Um, your guests are not going to have one drink per person. No. Right, correct. <laughs> Having at least three glasses for every guest is crucial. And if you don't want to shell out all that dough, help is just a phone call away. Call your local rental company. If you don't want to go out and buy 50 glasses, you can rent them. You know, 35 cents a glass. And it will save you uh, a lot of trouble. Extra glasses, finger foods, and a bartender are key elements to any cocktail party. But before the guests arrive, don't forget to set the mood. Music, big thing. Okay. Never ever, when hosting a cocktail party, have your guests walk into a dead room. Okay. okay? Tony's completed his mission for the day. Have a great time. Okay. It's all well, about thank that. You so okay? much. No You're problem. Wonderful. Now it's up to Maysoon to kick it into high gear. She still needs to buy some last-minute goodies at her favorite stores. I have another cheese that's really good. It's uh, Petite Basque that comes from the Pyrenees. That is delicious. Oh, these are cute. Yeah. Do you have little umbrellas? We do, actually. We do. The clock is ticking, but so far everything is right on schedule. Hi! Hi. Bartender's here. Thank you guys for coming. Hi. Mwah. 
Once the party's in full swing, don't sweat the small stuff. Follow these insider tricks and you'll have an elegant evening that's made to order. To measure your success, just take a look around. If the guests don't want to leave, raise your glass to a job well done. This one seems to be going strong, so I think we're going to keep it going. Because I don't see any reason to stop it. Coming up, we're setting aside the alcohol and mixing up some drinks for non-drinkers. But we're not talking about Virgin Marys and Shirley Temples. We'll show you what today's most imaginative bartenders are serving up without the liquor. Welcome to the wonderful world of fairy tale weddings. June 19th through 20th. Non-alcoholic options to explore. You may know how to layer a specialty drink, create the perfect Cosmo, and make a Manhattan that's bar none. But in order to be the perfect host, you'll need to cater to everyone in your crowd. That's why number four on our insiders list is drinks for non-drinkers. A really popular trend in the last few years now has been non-alcoholic drinks. Cocktails and juice, I mean, you can make a lot of the same types of drinks, but they're non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic cocktails are popping up in bars everywhere, and they've even earned a unique nickname. A lot of bars today and home cocktail servers get into the world of what we call mocktails. Before mocktails, non-drinkers were left to wallow in the malaise of Shirley Temples and soda water. But these days, the designated driver is being offered some incredibly sophisticated options. The magical world of mocktails is finally coming into its own and bringing new flavors to non-drinkers everywhere. What's big right now is pomegranate. It's a great color. You stick a tropical flower on top. It can be done in anything. Crush ice with pomegranate. There's, there's a million virgin drinks uh, in there. Sure, they're non-drinker classics, but virgin margaritas and pina coladas are just regular cocktails minus the alcohol. Drinks like these will make abstainers feel more like afterthoughts than guests. For the real mocktail treatment, there's no substitute for creativity. Can I get a coconut lime, Ricky? Catherine Gardner is a bartender at Saucebox in Portland, and she knows a thing or two about mocktails. I was asked about a month ago to do, get some mocktails um, together for a magazine article, and I'm also seven months pregnant right now, so I uh, was experimenting with them already. Catherine's number one specialty is an impressive concoction she calls the Raspberry Cooler Martini. It's an assault on the senses, and here's how it's done. Take a beautiful cocktail glass, add an elegant sugared rim, blend in a few juicy ingredients, and behold, it's a non-alcoholic delight that will make you forget all about booze. But Catherine has more than just raspberry coolers in her arsenal. Check out the cucumber lemonade. This super refreshment is a simple blend of crushed cucumbers and ice, topped off with freshly squeezed lemons and a healthy dose of simple syrup. The cucumber lemonade, they're delicious. And for Catherine's specialty, the non-drinkers of Portland swear by the Virgin Haido, an Asian concoction of ginger and hibiscus. First, she breaks out her old-fashioned muddler, crushing mint leaves into ice. And then a hibiscus syrup. Uh, we make this here with uh, herbal hibiscus tea. And voila, perfection without the headache. Outrageous cocktails like these spell certain doom for boring sodas and virgin varieties everywhere. They'll be a welcome addition at your next cocktail bash, so why not give them a try? You'll thank us in the morning. There are thousands of cocktail lounges all across America, and whether you live in a teeming metropolis or a small town, there's a lively little haven in your area, guaranteed. That's why knowing your hotspots comes in at number three on our insiders list. While some lounges are a throwback to another era, like the 70-year-old Rainbow Room in New York City, others, like the Flatiron Lounge, draw the in-crowd with a new twist on old-fashioned drinks. From Bimbo's 365 Club in San Francisco to 1150 in Atlanta, cocktail lounges are as diverse as the American public they serve. 
like the cocktail itself, a successful watering hole can be made from a variety of ingredients. It could be the lighting's great in a place, and it's really intimate, and it's comfortable, and the bartenders are fun, and they make interesting drinks. There's another effective way to create a relaxed and inviting atmosphere. Just listen to the music. If there's loud techno music booming, you're in the wrong place. It's not a cocktail bar. It's just a big pickup scene. In many cases, the most critical design element shines from above. That's why insiders say good lighting is key. Good lighting and good music, that's really about it. A nice environment. Some place we can kick back and not have to yell over everything. Oftentimes, it's easy to pinpoint a classic watering hole by its age and experience. Musso and Frank's on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles has been serving up perfect martinis for more than 80 years. In Portland, hot spots like Mint Restaurant and 820 Lounge fill the bill by serving up cocktails with all fresh ingredients. Cool cocktail corners also come in the form of clever gimmicks. At Beauty Bar in Los Angeles, you can grab a Cosmo and get your nails done. Places like the Downtown Standard in LA offer up swimming pools, water beds, and a spectacular view from the lounge on the roof. If you're visiting a city for the first time, ask around. It won't be tough to get the local lowdown. Then put on your party face and set off to explore. If you're in kind of a place you're not really too familiar with, go to the locals, they'll tell you where to go. You know, they know what's going on better than you do, so I usually trust them. Coming up on the Insider's List of Cocktails, we'll take your bartending skills to new heights. Now these are bar tricks you won't find at your local watering hole. Exotic spirits are an easy way to put some real pizzazz into your next drink party, but they're not for everyone, at least not straight up. We're going to show you one way to lessen the blow and give your guests a low... Welcome back to the Insider's List. Now, we've shared some top bartending secrets with you, and you've seen how to order the simplest to the most complex of cocktails. What's left? Well, what about discovering how to elevate the humble cocktail into a work of art? Adorning the number two spot on our list is how to serve cocktails with flair. It has to look good. It has to look delicious. It has to be alluring to the senses because if you want to take in something, you first have to be attracted to it in a way. Foxy-looking drinks were first brought into fashion by ladies who liked to lunch and sip back in the good old days. The... Um, uh, golden Cadillac, the Pink Squirrel, the Pink Lady, um, the Gin Fizz, all those kind of drinks were invented for women because it didn't, it wasn't socially acceptable for a woman to sit down and have a glass of gin. But these days, elaborate elixirs have become a must for everyone. So how do you add a dash of panache to your repertoire? You can go green by adding the fresh melon liqueur Midori or chase out the blues by sipping some curacao. If you're dreaming about deep purple but want to save on the greenbacks, for about $7, you can color your world with Parfait Amour. It's a French orange liqueur. Although it's not colored like orange, it's purple. So if you just splash a little bit with vodka, it suddenly has this twinkling purple color, and then put a little orange twist in it, and it's magic. It's easy to improve cocktail wizardry by serving or sipping drinks with pizzazz. But what if you want to raise the bar even higher and take cocktails to a sizzling new extreme? Gentlemen. Scott Young is one of the world's hottest performance bartenders. He's been studying his craft for over 15 years. And for Scott, drink preparation is serious business. We really want to uh, basically be a performer behind the bar, have a little fun, and give customers a reason to you know, come to the bar, stay a little longer, spend more money, and walk away talking about what a great time they had. Scott has used his years of experience to start ExtremeBartending.com, a company dedicated to teaching the art of the aerial. But hang on to your shot glass. Before you try this at home, you'll need to know the rules. First and foremost, stick to the basics. 
to show us how, we conjured up two of the most extreme flair bartenders from the Roxy Bar in Vancouver, British Columbia. All right, the very first move to learn is a single flip. Nice and light feet, light hand position, up and down. Once you get that, you can go reverse grip or behind the neck and pass it off. You can try this at home, but don't start with bottles. First, try things that don't break, like fruit or plastic. When you're ready to move up to bottles, we have one last insider's piece of advice. Start by practicing in the yard. Grass, absolutely soft surfaces, so it's a little bit less risky. <laughs> So knock yourself out and give it a try. To err is human, keep that in mind. But serving with flair, now that's divine. Stick around, there's a lot more cocktail info when we come back. There are lots of ingredients to fight aging. One. Cocktail novice to master mixologist is nearly complete. But if there's one thing every drinker needs to know, it's how to deal with the morning after. More importantly, how to prevent the dreaded hangover. People go to great lengths to recuperate from the achy exhaustion that results from too much drinking. And everyone has their own special remedy. Hair of the dog. Straight to the Mexican food. I heard Gatorade's the best. Overindulgers will down anything from raw eggs to Bloody Marys. But here's what you really need to know. Home remedies might help you overcome your hangover on a psychological level. But there's no basis for them from a scientific standpoint. Combating the effects of too much drinking is an extreme extremely misunderstood topic. So how to deal with a hangover is item number one on our insider's list. The true cause of any hangover is dehydration, plain and simple. Alcohol is a diuretic, which means even one cocktail will make you lose more water than you take in. Multiply this by three or four drinks, and that's a lot of water missing from your system. When you wake up after a night of cocktailing, stay away from caffeine. It will dehydrate you even more. The only way to fight the dehydration is to replenish the missing water. So load up on H2O. But water isn't the only thing you lose when you drink alcohol. You also lose electrolytes. So believe it or not, reaching for that Gatorade is actually not a bad idea. Gatorade before to rehydrate you. Anything to stay away from dehydration, that's the key. But if you're really serious about fighting hangovers, you'll need more than Gatorade. Loading up on potassium and magnesium is the best way to make yourself feel normal again. The best sources of potassium can be found in foods like bananas, avocados, and potatoes. To replenish the magnesium, reach out for whole grains nuts and dark chocolate. Whatever you decide to pump into your body, just don't reach out for those painkillers. Taking painkillers like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and aspirin when you have alcohol in your system can seriously damage your esophagus, liver, and even the lining of your stomach. So avoid them at all cost. And load up on the vitamins and minerals that come from the basic food groups and nature's ultimate cocktail, water. Watch your consumption of sugary foods and drinks. They'll make your headache even worse. And if you really want to avoid that hangover, the best cure is prevention. Don't drink too much in the first place. Obviously, drinking in moderation is helpful for hangovers or lack thereof. From a delicious non-alcoholic Haido to the intoxicating allure of absinthe, we've learned a lot about cocktail culture. So remember our top 10 insider secrets, and you'll be drinking in the good life for years to come. We hope you've had fun and learned some things you never knew, but most of all, we hope you feel inspired to explore the cocktail landscape on your own. If you'd like to learn more about cocktails and great drink recipes, just log on to our website at fineliving.com. I'm Julie Moran, and until next time, here's to the cocktail, and thanks for watching The Insider's List. Live like you mean it. By serving or sipping drinks with pizzazz. But what if you want to raise the bar even higher and take cocktails to a sizzling new extreme? Gentlemen.
Scott Young is one of the world's hottest performance bartenders. He's been studying his craft for over 15 years. And for Scott, drink preparation is serious business. We really want to uh, basically be a performer behind the bar, have a little fun, and give customers a reason to you know, come to the bar, stay a little longer, spend more money, and walk away talking about what a great time they had. Scott has used his years of experience to start ExtremeBartending.com, a company dedicated to teaching the art of the aerial. But hang on to your shot glass. Before you try this at home, you'll need to know the rules. First and foremost, stick to the basics. To show us how, we conjured up two of the most extreme flair bartenders from the Roxy Bar in Vancouver, British Columbia. All right, the very first move to learn is a single flip. Nice and light feet, light hand position, up and down. Once you get that, you can go reverse grip or behind the neck and pass it off. You can try this at home, but don't start with bottles. First, try things that don't break, like fruit or plastic. When you're ready to move up to bottles, we have one last insider's piece of advice. Start by practicing in the yard. Grass, absolutely soft surfaces, so it's a little bit less risky. So knock yourself out and give it a try. To err is human, keep that in mind. But serving with flair, now that's divine. Scott Young is one of the world's hottest performance bartenders. He's been studying his craft for over 15 years. And for Scott, drink preparation is serious business. We really want to uh, basically be a performer behind the bar, have a little fun, and give customers a reason to you know, come to the bar, stay a little longer, spend more money, and walk away talking about what a great time they had. Scott has used his years of experience to start ExtremeBartending.com, a company dedicated to teaching the art of the aerial. But hang on to your shot glass. Before you try this at home, you'll need to know the rules. First and foremost, stick to the basics. To show us how, we conjured up two of the most extreme flair bartenders from the Roxy Bar in Vancouver, British Columbia. All right, the very first move to learn is a single flip. Nice and light feet, light hand position, up and down. Once you get that, you can go reverse grip or behind the neck. And pass it off. You can try this at home, but don't start with bottles. First, try things that don't break, like fruit or plastic. When you're ready to move up to bottles, we have one last insider's piece of advice. Start by practicing in the yard. Grass, absolutely soft surfaces, so it's a little bit less risky. So knock yourself out and give it a try. To err is human, keep that in mind. But serving with flair, now that's divine. Points given for degree of difficulty in the exhibition moves, and like the poor test and speed rounds, points are deducted for mistakes. I'm one of the accuracy judges, so basically what we're looking for is good business. We're looking for no spills, for no drops. We're looking for make sure you get the, the correct drink, uh, all the right ingredients, that sort of thing. So basically think of me as the bar manager sitting here and watching the contest and watching my money either go out the window or go into the glass. As the judge